Today we're going to talk about the fact that apparently coffee pods are now better for the environment than traditional filter brewed coffee, which seems surprising. It is surprising. Let's talk about it. So the way it all started was uh, a bunch of academics in Quebec published an article, it's basically a blog post, on a website called The Conversation that was then excitedly picked up by a bunch of media outlets and sort of breathlessly regurgitated the BBC going with coffee pod carbon footprint better for planet than filtered brew. I had to look into it because a lot of you sent me this article and were like, is this true? Is this real? Does this make any sense? And a lot of coffee people got pretty annoyed about it because there's some fundamental issues with it. But diving into the research, going right through it, there's some stuff that we should probably talk about because it is interesting and surprising and occasionally a little bit annoying. Quick PSA before we get too far into it, I do want to remind you that the whole idea of your personal carbon footprint was invented by British Petroleum to kind of make you feel bad and take the pressure off them. You, through better actions alone, in your home, in your daily life, cannot fundamentally mitigate the problems of climate crisis. We should do better and we should waste less, I 100% agree with that, but we need fundamental change at a much higher level to really stave off the climate crisis that we are in. Just want to highlight that before we talk too much about your personal impact and how you brew your coffee. So what these researchers have done is a kind of meta-analysis, uh, and they've kind of cobbled together the carbon impact of brewing a cup of coffee four different ways. Now I would argue that the base premise of this is fundamentally flawed. What they've done is they've, they've said we're going to brew 280 mils of coffee, finished liquid coffee. So that's like a, a 10 ounce cup to people who work in the old money. What they then did is looked at traditional filter coffee, and it's important to understand that that is not a pour over, that is a, a electric coffee brewing machine. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Secondly, they looked at encapsulated coffee. Now there's a bunch of different coffee pods. Uh, this is the sort of Nespresso Virtua ones, this is the little Nespresso ones. These are Jacobs, I don't even know what these are. For this I think they're using K-cups, which are popular in the US. Then they used French presses, and then they used instant coffee, and they compared the impact. Now right at the start of this there was a giant red flag for me when they talked about how much coffee they were going to use to brew that 10 ounces of beverage. Because this is kind of where the whole thing begins to fall apart for me. They said for the traditional filter, people use 25 grams to make a, a 10 ounce, a 280 ml beverage. I'm not sure that they do. Then they took a K cup, which had about 14 grams of coffee inside it, which is, which is a lot less than 25 grams, already kind of weird. Then they took 17 grams of coffee for the French press. Okay, maybe a little bit more normal. And then soluble coffee, instant coffee. Confusingly, they say 12 grams of coffee. Now what does that even mean? 12 grams of instant coffee? I don't think so, that's a little bit absurd. Now if you read the link in the study, it links you back to something that tells you that to produce about a kilo of soluble coffee would take about two kilos of roasted coffee. So I'm presuming when they say 12 grams of coffee, they're using six grams of soluble coffee, which is a lot. That's more than most manufacturers would recommend you use. Let me just give you a quick visual demonstration of six grams of instant coffee. That's six grams. No one's making this much coffee with six grams of instant. That's just weird. It should be actually pretty more like three grams of instant. That would be closer to manufacturer's recommendations. But already I kind of feel like the people writing this don't have a great understanding of coffee itself. Now, if you're a pod drinker, maybe you'll argue this fact with me, but in my life when I've drunk pod coffee, especially little capsules like this, kind of one is never enough. The dose makes the poison. I would find that I would need to drink two or maybe three of these to get a normal amount of caffeine, which might be why I'm drinking pod coffee in the first place. And so saying you can make a weaker beverage with a pod than you can with normal coffee, and therefore it's better, is a super weird position to take in this whole thing. But then something else kind of stood out to me as being kind of weird. Their base premise is that filter coffee is bad primarily because it uses more coffee and coffee produces loads of emissions when you grow it and, and all of that kind of stuff. And so using more coffee is worse for the environment. That's kind of a weird argument to make for what I hope is fairly obvious reasons. It does nothing to do with how you make your coffee. If you want to drink more coffee in the day, you're going to have more impact on the world in doing so. That's a sort of inescapable and obvious fact and probably not worthy of a blog post. But looking at the actual data, I got more confused. And I went and I read the papers that they linked, 
and I got even more confused at how they got to the numbers they got. Now, if you look at the little chart, you'll see that the, the largest chunk on all of them is the orange section, which they have labeled as green coffee preparation. And they said that 25 grams of, of coffee, used in filter coffee, generated about 150 grams of uh, emissions along the way, and I didn't really understand that. Now, I read the paper that they linked to, and frankly, it is a wild piece of literature. They say that coffee can be really bad. It can be up to 15.3 kilos of emissions per kilo of green coffee grown. But if you do things a bit more sustainably, it goes down to 3.51. Confusingly, in the article, it looks like they're using a figure of about 6 kilos per kilo emissions for coffee production. So then I, I dug into this. How are these numbers so varied, so wide? Well, this paper makes a, an astonishing leap. Uh, and they say people are, are looking for fresher and fresher coffee. And so what's happening is they're air freighting raw coffee from origin to the point of consumption. They're not, especially not commercial coffees like coffees grown on large farms in Brazil and Vietnam, which is what this study is looking at. Nobody's air freighting commercial grade coffee. Air freighting coffee is ridiculous. I've done it in my career two, three times, always kind of wrapped up in the mania of barista competition. It's expensive, it's ridiculous, it's bad. Everyone's kind of chasing the freshest green coffee, sure, but this is not relevant to commercial or normal coffee consumption. So once you get into that, once you strip out the fact that, yeah, if you do air freight a bunch of coffee 10,000 kilometers, that has an impact on the environment, well, yeah, all the numbers start to dwindle. And there's a really interesting chart here, which has a sort of breakdown of the actual production costs. And if you do it sustainably and you, you know, cargo ship the coffee as is normally done, the figure is down to 0.2 to 0.4 kilos of emissions per kilo of coffee, which is still a really long way from that 3.5 number that they started with, because the rest of this paper adds in more emissions for stuff like roasting, packaging, all of that kind of stuff. The problem is, back to the conversation, they're adding on stuff like roasting and preparation and packaging and shipping and all of that kind of stuff too. So that emissions data kind of appears twice. And so actually, if you had sustainably grown coffee as you would typically find for specialty that has been shipped on cargo ships, as is normal, then your 25 grams of filter coffee might produce, I don't know, something like eight grams of CO2, which is a lot less than the 150 that they're claiming here. So already, I've got a big problem with this. But on the plus side, it's a mistake that they make for everything across the board here. The other area that kind of left me a little bit confused was the sort of section for landfill. If you look at this, they say that sending uh, 25 grams of coffee, or probably less actually, it'd be about 18 to 20 grams of coffee after extraction, plus the filter paper to landfill, generated more emissions than sending an aluminium pod to landfill too. In most cases, I hope most of us are not sending our coffee to landfill and it's going to be composted through proper food waste channels. That would be good. And yes, if you do let paper decompose in landfill, it does emit methane and methane is bad. But the idea that it's it's like there's no impact if you just bury an aluminum capsule in landfill because aluminum's inert, which is the premise that they're going with here, that seems kind of wild. But it still seems weird to me to say, yeah, filter papers are bad for the environment. It's better to just manufacture some aluminium and bury it in landfill. That's quite a claim. Like that's just, that's a lot for me to take in. And I'm not sure I fundamentally agree with that. And I know aluminium can be recycled and it should be recycled. And it's a very good idea to recycle aluminium. And if you do use these pods, please, empty them, send them for recycling, be a good human. But yeah, the idea that these are somehow better than paper, I, I just fundamentally struggle with that. So you might think, great, I use a V60, I use a normal amount of coffee, I heat an appropriate amount of water, I'm probably fine. And I was thinking, yeah, that should be good news, right? And then something just needled the back of my brain and it was soluble coffee. It was instant again, because I didn't understand how instant could be sort of low impact from an energy consumption perspective. If you make a filter coffee, that's the first time that you're brewing that coffee. With instant coffee, that's actually the second time that you're heating water and brewing that coffee. To make instant coffee, you take a bunch of ground coffee, you uh, extract it incredibly aggressively. I'll touch on that in a second. Then you would take that liquid, perhaps concentrate it further, and then you would spray dry it or freeze dry it, ship it around the world, and then you would then heat water a second time and brew it kind of a second time, or kind of reconstitute it, because it's just a, a freeze dry product. I thought that would be bad. 
but I looked into it, and there are papers analyzing this kind of stuff. It does get kind of interesting. And it turns out because instant coffee is so efficient in a whole bunch of ways, it's nothing like the energy impact that I expected. Now, when I brew a filter coffee, I might get 20 to maybe 25% of the grounds dissolved in the cup down below. And the limit is typically considered to be about 30%. The rest is just not soluble, unless you've got the fancy toys. And instant manufacturers can basically break down the insoluble material to make it soluble and get their yield all the way up to 50% which is how two kilos of coffee can become one kilo of instant coffee. That's amazing. You're, you're basically taking stuff that has no real flavor. It's kind of a bulking agent, but it is extraction, and that's a thing. And because they do it, you know, so intensely and at such high concentrations, per gram of instant, the energy usage is actually pretty low. And so when you reheat it later, it's, it's kind of not that bad. And that surprised me a great deal. Speaking of heating water, and this is the other thing that we need to talk about. Pod machines do have an irritating advantage. Let me get one real quick. This is an espresso pod machine. Uh, it's a company called Morning. It's a fancy one. It's very nice if you like that sort of thing. But the way that these things generally work is very clever. They have a small heating block inside them. Uh, and because they're only going to heat a small amount of water to brew this little pod, they get hot really quickly without drawing loads and loads of energy. Cheaper Nespresso machines never really get to higher temperatures either. They're not particularly temperature stable. But then let's take a, a nice, fancy espresso machine. That might take 20 to 30 minutes of pretty solid power consumption to get up to a stable temperature. This might be there in a couple of minutes. Most Nespresso machines that you can buy will go from off to brewing coffee in under two minutes. That's a lot faster than 20 to 30. But then you dial in your espresso blend. Maybe the first shot runs a little fast. You want to make it again. All of that waste adds up, and very quickly, the waste of brewing espresso at home is really a big deal. So if you're dialing in over and over, there are emissions associated with that waste, but as I've said, nowhere near the emissions claimed, I think, by this article in The Conversation. Ultimately, the takeaways from this are, you should be mindful about the coffee that you brew. And yes, conventionally grown coffee, coffee grown on very large farms in full sun that needs loads of irrigation and fertilizer, as you might find in larger farms in Brazil and Vietnam, that will have a, a harder impact on the environment than specialty coffee grown in small farms with shade or, you know, kind of mixed crops in there too. Coffee is not a simple thing. And if you look at all the papers, no one really agrees on anything. But I think what we can agree on is we should be less wasteful. We should brew coffee we care about and enjoy and take maximum pleasure from because it is having an impact on the world. And yeah, maybe pods aren't the answer that they say it is here. There's waste. You need to brew more of them to get a good cup. Uh, and I just don't think it's as simple as pods are better for the environment than filtered coffee. But now I want to hear from you down in the comments below. Have you read this article? Were you as confused as me? Buy it. Have you read the links that they link to? Thank you again to SciHub. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below, but for now I will say thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.